All right, welcome. This is going to be Tri Rods, December of 2023. And I'm going to introduce myself. So I'm Terrell. I'm going to talk about uh, the iRods S3 API, which we, I guess we got it out the door 010 in November, just before supercomputing. And this is a talk that was mostly given back in June at our uh, user group meeting, but now with more release and more demo. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, we're going to talk about the reason we're doing this and kind of how we got, got here, as well as through some of the research that we did to uh, get to the point where we have code that runs. Uh, talk about the actual code that we have, the status, the implementation details that we went through, uh, a little bit about the architecture and, and how to hold it, and then some of the next steps. It turns out that everybody just wants to talk to S3. It took over the world for good reason. It's very easy. It's comprehensible. It is, uh, at this point, safe because lots of other people have done it, so you're not in uncharted waters. There's lots of existing clients out there, and it does do a good job of decoupling your authentication system at your institution or organization from uh, getting access to the data. So some people like that uh, if that's um, if that's a plus. It also aligns with the IROD's uh, consortium's protocol plumbing efforts over the last couple of years. We've been trying to make uh, using IROD's a bit less uh, esoteric and weird. Uh, people don't want to learn new things if if they, they see that as friction to to adoption and, and integration efforts. So we've spent time making iRods more uh, uh, approachable and accessible to other protocols. So we've been doing work to uh, provide an onboarding e exercise for uh, NFS, for SFTP, for, for WebDAV, for uh, other things. And so this S3 effort is uh, some of the same aligns with the same goals. Uh, and of course, you know, we know that protocols don't change very often uh, on the order of you know, years and decades. And so that means that they are relatively maintainable if you can get them up and running and, and behaving as expected. So what we want to do is to present IRODS, which is its own protocol, as the S3 protocol. We would love to reuse as much as possible and not reinvent things because that requires maintenance and effort. Uh, we This has to be load balancer friendly, so it has to uh, be deployed by grown-ups in grown-up ways. And of course, again, we want it to be maintainable. So we spent time uh, a couple years ago. Yeah, look at that, two, two years, almost two and a half years ago now, uh, and spun up a work, one of our working groups for the IRADS Consortium uh, this is a, a link. It's It works. These are the history and the, the minutes and everything of our discussions uh, for over two years. And in that initial email that I sent in July of 2021, we had four options. Uh, these are the options we had at the, at the time. We were going to update and maintain an existing project, maybe convert it to do something a little different, maybe touch it in such a way that it could be upstreamed into another project or we do it ourselves. And those were the four at the time. Uh, we were leaning towards option three uh, as the best option in terms of getting thing out the door that, that would just work. Um, and we investigated those, those different four options across, uh, I, I broke them into four phases. Um, options one through three were these other things. Option four was our own proof of concept for C++, and then to talk about the other the other pieces that we that we investigated. So. Uh, phase one was looking at these other three options. It turns out that um, uh, MinIO with Go rods was not really going to be maintainable. We wanted something in pure Go. Uh, option two was going to do that, but after iterating a few times, it looks like it might as well just use the C++ REST API that we had. So that didn't, uh, that wasn't terribly interesting to do that work. And then also we needed multi-user and multi-bucket functionality from an S3 service. And the MinIO client does not offer multi-user functionality. Uh, the other thing is that the gateway code fires too late uh, for that to be the case. So we were not in charge of the authentication into MinIO. So that was off the table. Um, option three was to get the work into MinIO, and that was possible. 
and not necessarily use the gateway, but also the rug pull happened in May of 2022 and MinIO being a funded enterprise uh, decided that they were deprecating their gateway altogether. So that was also off the table. Uh, and of course, a reminder that, you know, you are only as strong as your dependencies. So if we were going to be a dependency or if that was going to be a dependency of our success, um, we decided to go a different way. So option four was removing those dependencies and talking about how one IROD's collection could be mapped to a single bucket. Uh, of course, we still have multi-user uh, capability. And then we set about finding the, the right framework for this work. Uh, we went through a few different um, C++ frameworks and chose uh, Boost Beast about a year ago. And within a month, we had some basic uh, endpoints working, including uh, some vanilla user mapping and bucket mapping that we had to had to handle in this in this layer. In an alternate universe, uh, we had Il Young at Arizona investigating other things. And so again, what if we don't have to build this ourselves? And so he looked at a variety of things of putting uh, you know, virtual file system plugins in behind something or putting a shim in, in front of something else. Uh, and none of these turned out to be viable, mostly because of the multi-bucket and uh, multi-user requirements. And so off we went to decide how to do multi-part. Turns out multi-part's hard. We have no favorite on this list of the options that we could brain out. It turns out that we think that we have one now labeled E, which is just off screen. You can't see it. Also known as we haven't written it down yet, but we have a, we have it, we have it drawn. We've got it. Uh, we've got an idea. Uh, I think we can handle it in part because we may be able to hide behind a load balancer. And so we don't have to solve the um, multi computer problem. So that was hard. We saved it for later. Uh, by June, we started to have some tests and then by November, um, and, and of course now December, uh, we've shown success with the AWS client, um, the Bodo 3 library, uh, MinIO, both the Python client as well as the, the command line. And these are, these are working and, and part of our test suite. So the way this ends up working, we have a binary sitting, a single binary sitting in front of the IROD server. It is listening to uh, S3 clients. They are coming across regular HTTP or HTTPS, depending on how it's configured. They show up with a key pair. And we have to translate that into an IROD's username and then speak the IROD's protocol out of the other side of the API to the IROD system. Uh, that means that this binary does require ROD's admin credentials to do that proxy. And, uh, but it is a single binary with a single config file. Uh, as of today, or as of last month, uh, these are the implemented endpoints. Uh, these are the things that we set out to do at the beginning, except for multi-part. Um, we can move things around, we can copy them, list them, ask the system for bucket information, and that that all works. Uh, up next is the multi-part adventure. Uh, I believe we've brained it out, but we haven't gotten there yet. We also haven't looked at delete objects. That is a plural. Uh, You'll note the S on the end of delete objects. We have not decided yet whether we want to take action on multiple things, but we do have to support the endpoint. So there's a discussion about how to do that. Uh, the same thing with uh, list objects, uh, as well as ACLs and tagging. Uh, we know that we could map IROD's permission model over to AWS or S3 protocol permissions. It's not clear exactly what that looks like yet. Uh, and of course, those need to be bidirectional. And then um, the same thing with tagging. So IRODs can have unlimited, what we call AVUs or, or uh, key value pairs or, or annotations on, on things, including data objects. Uh, I think S3 protocol is limited to 10. So then we have to have a, an honest conversation about what does that mean if someone tries to do something with an 11th? Um, what does the error code look like? How do we convey that? Not sure yet. And we don't even really know what upload part copy is yet. We're just going to ignore that. But that's where we are. We've done we've done a pretty good job. Uh, it is behaving. The uh, This is the configuration file. It basically has two sides of the same single file. There's an S3 server side, 
And then there's the IRUDS client side. Um, the S3 server side defines a port. It has two. Uh, this is the this is the bucket information. This is where the bucket mapping happens. So you've got bucket names and the path to the collection inside of IRODs. And that's, um, uh, you can have a, uh, this is a, a dictionary. So there's lots of them. You can have multiple buckets pointing to multiple collections. And then we have the, the current static resolver for username as well. So we've got S3 username and the secret key. Again, these are defined in a JSON file for today. But the idea is that this is picking up a shared object inside the server. And we had, so this is a pluggable model where we can design and develop other mapping schemes, both for buckets and for users and swap them out later as we come up with good ideas from the community and kind of solidify them. Uh, we can talk about uh, buffer sizes and number of threads and things like that. So um, that's the that's the extent of the S3 server side of things. The client side of things is very familiar. It's just a, a host, a port, a zone. And then we have the admin account information for you know username and password. And that's how it does the proxying for whichever user got mapped on the other side when talking to IRODs. So the next steps, that's where we are today. The next steps are going through some testing, making sure we have the coverage. Uh, we would like to bang on it for real. And so we have some friends uh, around the world who are gonna do that. Uh, we're gonna help where necessary. We do want to tackle the multi-part. We know that's an essential piece of making this a success. And then, of course, like I said, the multiple additional plugins for, you know, the buckets and the users. Um, we expect that to maybe encapsulate things like going and talking to an LDAP system or uh, keeping another database somewhere where there's a, a GUI for that. Um, we, we don't know. We're, we're open to good ideas. So for testing, uh, again, here's a picture for what this is, uh, the S3 client of whatever flavor it is, uh, comes to S3, this, this piece of software in the middle, and then sits in front of IRODs. So if we can fake it enough, then we've passed the test. So we currently have 66 tests defined in the public repo. All the repos are public, so that doesn't, that's not an important qualifier. Uh, these come directly out of the test files that are there right now. And they run in under three minutes uh, on the computer that I ran it on. So uh, that's good. And it, it does demonstrate the things that we've got. It's covering, you'll notice it's covering uh, the AWS tool, uh, the Bodo tool, and the Minio client, as well as the Minio Python library. So um, we do have four clients represented here. And we can want to continue to, to fill these out as we find corner cases and, and, and weirdness. So the rest of this is going to be a demo of something that's even weirder, right? So what if the S3 client is not Bodo or AWS or MinIO? What if the S3 client is our own IRODS S3 resource plugin? We are also an S3 client when we talk to Amazon and put files into S3 uh, on the storage side of things. So what I'm going to do here is potentially plug in, sorry, I can't use that word. We're going to connect the S3 resource plugin behind IRODs into another IRODs that's sitting behind an S3 API. So this is the new piece of software, and we're going to test it by pretending that we are something like AWS uh, CLI or MinIO or Bodo. All right, so we have an ASCII, ASCINEMA, it's tough to say, recorded. And I'm gonna hit play and talk over it. And here we go. So we're gonna jump into a TMUX session, which has nothing in it at the moment. And we're going to have the two zones. We're going to have zone A and zone B. So the first one is on the left. And then the, the zone B is going to be on the right, or in this case, top and bottom. So we're going to uh, first show how this is done. So this is all done in uh, Docker Compose. So we've got uh, five 
This is uh, five containers. We've got a catalog, two catalogs and two providers, and then the S3 API uh, sitting in the middle. And you can see that there's nothing weird going on here. It's just uh, it's just standing these up. Uh, the two catalogs are Postgres. Uh, and then the one in the middle here is using a single um, a single config file that I'll show you in a second. And then on the bottom is the catalog and then the other provider. And they're just vanilla out of the box. The zone A is 431 with the S3 resource plugin already installed. Uh, so we are going to create an S3 key pair um, and then an S3 resource in zone A to pretend we're just going to talk to an S3 bucket. It doesn't happen to know that it's us pretending to be an S3 bucket, but uh, we're going to do that. So you'll see the config here for that. This is just the setup, the, the initial setup script for um, the entry point for that first container. And you can see there's S3 Alice and S3 A pass is going to sit into the key pair. And then we're making an S3 resource with, uh, we're, we're pointing to the host name of the other container that we've got stood up. And here's the key pair that we're going to use. Uh, this is cacheless attached. Everything else is kind of default. Um, nothing, nothing weird happening here. This is just configuring S3 to talk to uh, a place on the internet that will be serving as S3, which happens to be the other container. And then uh, zone B is also 431. It has an Alice and uh, its entry point just has one line it's right here. So there's Alice, nothing, nothing else going on in there. And then the configuration file uh, has a mapping for the bucket name for B and that user for Alice, which we already saw in the key pair. So this is where it's going to happen. So here is temp zone B bucket. It's going to be put in Alice's home directory, home collection. Uh, here is, this is the IROD's username that's going to be resolved from the S3 username and password, or secret key, rather. And then the IROD's client, of course, is talking to, uh, the IROD's client side of the S3 API is going to talk to zone B, represented by provider B. And it's going to do that as rods rods because it's going to proxy for Alice. So we're going to start this Docker Compose. And it takes a few seconds to come up. There's five containers. Uh, here comes the catalog A and B. This is just Postgres waking up. Once those are awake, then both of the providers wake up and install iRods. And then they run their little configuration file that we saw, and then they are putting logs on the screen, and then the API wakes up because it was waiting on uh, port uh, B to be awake. So we're going to hop into a container. We're going to hop into the provider in, uh, in zone A just to make sure things are awake. And... We're going to show that the resource hierarchy is there's that S3 resource that was created and the details of it should look just like the way that we told it to be. And there it is. So we've got, it's pointing at the API. This is the, this is the name of the bucket it's supposed to be going into. Here's the key pair. And that's, that's it. So we can make a test file. So we're putting this into zone A, made a file, and we're going to put it, and it should show up in iRods. There, the, so the, you saw the API at the top uh, do its thing. It's giving logs. It's very noisy at the moment. And so I think we can see it, both the catalog entry and the physical path. We would expect to see this as an S3 resource. and. Here it is, just as if it had gone to Amazon proper. It's got a bucket name and then the, the path inside. But of course, 
that's a that's zone a thinking that it's in s3 right that's all it knows we know that it's not actually just in s3 and of course we can get it back by using the the hyphen for standard out and there it is the api was a little noisy we have a stat error that we need to track down um and that will get there but that's fine uh i think it's a I think it happened after everything else was finished. So the, the data came back. You can see it on the screen. Um, but remember, the physical file is actually in the other zone, in zone B, because we plugged them together. So now we're going to go into zone B and hop into the provider over there. And so we can see that the test file is sitting in that path, the logical path of Alice's home collection because that was the, bu the bucket mapping that we gave to the S3 API. And it had permission to write in here because it was getting proxied as Alice. So Alice has permission to write into Alice's collection. This is basically a personal bucket just for Alice. You'll see that this one is sitting in demo resc on zone B, which is really just like a normal vault that you would expect. So this is in the end sitting in the Unix file system on the second B on the second zone. And if we cat that file, that physical file, you'll see that that's where the data actually lives. So all clear so far. Now we're gonna to touch a different file. We're just gonna use iTouch and off it went. And again, same type of thing. It's, um, it's in the S3 resource, which is all a lie. And of course now it's gonna be over in zone B but we're not gonna show it to you because you already saw it. So now we're gonna to touch the existing file. So we're gonna see the timestamps on test and new file. So the test file came in at, uh, at, at 52 here. So if we touch it and then list it again, I think it will say 55. Yes, so it did update the modify time in the catalog but it did not touch the physical file over in the other zone. So the, the logical path was updated, but the physical path still says uh, 52. So that, that makes sense. We did not actually reach out to S3 and modify the file up there. So we've done puts and gets, we've done a little touch, and now we're gonna do some streaming. So we're going to put some data into a pipe and stream it into a new file called, new data object called streaming.txt. And you'll see the API wake up and off it goes. We can see it in the catalog. We can read it back. It should come back as a streaming file, there it is. I think we still have that other stat going on. Yep. Very good. And then to show that we are handling our truncates and streamings correctly, we're going to add some more stuff to it uh, and show it. And you'll see that the size got bigger. So it went up to 30 bytes this time. And we can see the same thing down here. It's also 30 bytes for streaming. And then if we try something shorter, a tiny stream, it will show up as, I think it's only 12, 12 bytes. And down here in zone B, it also updated everything correctly. So the bookkeeping is working. It's still 12 bytes on the disk on zone B. And that's good. So we can stream in and out of an object, handle that with the plugin, and then, um, the S3 API doesn't know any better, and so it handles it as it as it should. So we're going to tear all that down. Are there any questions so far? Anybody have any insights? <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Other than multi-part transfer, are there other features that users have asked for? Uh, that is the main one that we are concerned about. We know that people um, we know that people want some tagging. But we don't know what that exactly that means yet. We have to we have to have that conversation about those ten tags, uh, and what happens with the eleventh. <laughs> um, 
and then uh, the ACLs. But again, that's an un that's an unknown question, unknown answer yet. So more research required. But other than that, I think this this handles uh, the surface area of what people want right now. That answer the question. Yes. All right. Oh, Mustafa, did you unmute on purpose? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, I might have missed something. Uh, so that's why I will ask a question. Okay. Uh, which is which is about uh, the demo setup. Uh, you haven't uh, uh, zone A and B are not federated, right? That's correct. They're totally independent. Okay. They don't know about each other. Um, we were just showing that iRods with the S3 plugin can be a client. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Excellent. All right. So <laughs> we did it. That's the two zones. But what if we do something even worse? What if we go through the S3 plugin and go through the S3 API? But instead of going to a second zone, we just point it back at the original zone and then go to demo resk. So this is going to be, this, we, I don't think this is practically useful for anybody, but it was fun to see if it worked. And it, and it kind of did. So here we go. So we're going to go into the one zone directory. And so here's a tree. This one only has three containers. We've got a catalog, we've got a provider, and the API, but then we're going to point it right back at itself. And so we look at these. It's uh, much simpler. It's a lot of the same stuff, actually. I, don't, I think I just chopped it, right? So I just got rid of uh, the A's and the B's on the different zones. Now it just says provider and catalog. Uh, and that's it. So the zone, temp zone, creates a key pair, creates a resource, creates Bobby. So instead of Alice, we're going to have Bobby. And we have to create, uh, we have to make a place. So we're not going to use Bobby's home collection this time. We're going to make another place in the namespace uh, called Bucket Vault. And so I'm going to show you what that looks like. This is just the entry point for the provider. And so here is Bobby going into a key pair, same name for the resource. This time we're going into temp zone bucket. We're still talking to the container name that's handling the API for us. The rest of this is all the same. We are gonna make a Bobby user. We're gonna make a place for uh, the S3 API to write things down into the vault. And we have to grant Bobby permission to write things into vault. That's just to separate the, yeah, we didn't do that for Alice because Alice already has own permission on her own collection. In this case, I'm separating them and showing them that you can point to anywhere. Uh, and that's it for the config file. I think I show the S3, yes, the S3 config file as well. So it has a mapping for the bucket and a mapping for the user. And it looks very similar to before. Here is the bucket name. We're going to map to that collection. And again, this could be a number of them. We could have lots of different buckets to collection mappings. Um, it is a dictionary, so these these are these have to be unique uh, bucket names. But they only have to be unique within this uh, uh, deployment of the S3 API, right? This isn't a global namespace like, uh, like Amazon's is. Uh, and then here's the S3 username. Here's the password. And then that's going to be turned into proxying for the Bobby user. It's still the same. We're talking to the provider. This is temp zone. There's rods, rods. And I think we're off to the races. We're going to do the standing up of the three containers. So here comes Postgres. And then here comes the provider. And then because they depend on each other, uh, once the provider's up and awake, then the API wakes up and now it's listening. And we're going to hop into that provider and we're going to start, we're going to put a file into the system and it's going to go 
into the S3 resource, which is a lie, which is then going to come back and put it into demo risk. So multiple connections to the same system. Not convinced this is useful, but fun to prove that it worked. So here's the resources. Here's the same uh, different view of the same information again for the uh, S3 resource. We have the Ouroboros. So we have a file called Snakey Snake. I'm going to put that into the system. And it worked. And if we show it, there it is. It's in the S3 resource. It's 12 bytes long. It's sitting in temp zone bucket at that path. And we want to get it back. We have the stat, but there's the snakey snake. And then where's the physical file? It went over into that other bucket that we made, right? Over in the bucket vault. So if we look in the bucket vault, in the same zone, <laughs> there's the logical path. This is a different logical path because it's a separate object. This is There's two different data objects in the system for this one thing because this is a silly demo, um, but it's now living in the Unix file system under bucket vault because that's the, that's the name of it. And we did it, we got it back and it's sitting in the Unix file system. There's the, the cat of that file. And I think that's the end of the demo. Do you feel smarter having seen that? It's not clear if I felt smarter having done it. <laughs> and there we go, we did it. Are there any practical uses to plugging that in that way? Other than maybe testing corner cases. All right, well, yeah, ask question. some questions or we're gonna we're gonna cut this off. I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, after, so after you've played with this, have you managed to, has looking at the, the logical paths and physical paths become easier as you've stared at, at them? Because the last, you showing where the, the file exists in the uh, snakey snake case? Yes kind of broke my brain uh, yes. it, it was difficult to parse the the actual paths right yeah so uh there were two data objects there's the first one that's sitting in the s3 resource and then because of the way i wired it together in in trying to contact the s3 service that the s3 resources job was to go write it down in that s3 api reached back into irods and put the same stuff into a different place in irods so it's two different data objects in two different paths. Um, I can show it to you again. Let me see if I can do that. And then how do I, can I just fast forward through all of that? Ooh, I don't know if that's possible. I don't know how to fast forward through the ask anymore. Well, we'll have to show it offline. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's two different data uh, objects with uh, the same data name, but different collection names, right? And in different resources. It's not a right. replica. It's not a replica. It's a different data object with a different data ID. Okay. Yeah. Are the two paths somehow, is this kind of like a hard link? No. It's just that the place that the first data object is actually stored happens to be in the same IROD zone in a different logical path. It's not a hard link. It's not, um, there's no reference counters. There are two copies of the data in the system. So um, instead of 12 bytes, you know, there's actually, well, there's, there's two entries in the catalog uh, for 12 bytes, but there's only one, there, there's only 12 bytes on the disk in one place. 
if you were to remove the data object to which or that is pointing at the um physical data it would be equivalent to going into the vault and deleting the file from underneath the uh replica right kind of yeah 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 it, I, again i don't know that there's any practical use to this but it was kind of fun <laughs> to see that it worked uh, without any i mean the abstractions held well enough for it to just work and get out of its own way which i thought was pretty cool um but yeah i'm i'm, I'm very excited now to see that if we can get multi-part brained out um you know, for other people just to point whatever they've already got at it and, and see if it if it uh, works as expected. We do think that the uh, HTTPS problem, you know, we're not going to support that directly. We're just we're assuming we're going to be behind a proxy. Uh, we assume right now that that uh, high availability systems like HA proxy or other load balancers can what, what's it called? Uh, sticky sticky sessions, sticky yes. something like that. So. We don't have to worry about whether we get the same uh, session again from the same client. That's that's above. That would sit outside of where this is deployed. So we assume right now that someone could stand up two, three, four, five of these behind a load balancer, and um, you know support a, a significant load. That's to okay. be to be determined. Do, to be are, do you know if there's any state being stored in the S3 API at this time? I'm assuming that there's there's not i don't think there is outside of so the s3 plugin in irods has to do some like cache file stuff to to pretend it's talking to posix but that's all in the s3 plugin i think the s3 api doesn't doesn't have much to do at all um it gets a request and it and it talks to irods to do it so outside of the outside of the multi-part um uh communication or or like you know blackboard that has to be kept so that i know that we're working on the same thing together um i think we're good uh as soon as we and 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 i think um that's the ha solution for https also solves it the sticky sessions solve it for multi-part as well because a single client will get routed to the same s3 api so we don't have to communicate that that multi-part um context to all of its friends that are also behind the HA, I think, but again, we haven't tested that yet. All right, last chance. All right, we're going to stop the stop the sharing and uh, turn off the recording. We did it. Thank you. <laughs>